Hello, everybody. Crazy John here again with OSH Radio. And today I'm here with Eric Summer, who is a, uh, sh should we say, seasoned performer, singer? Uh, uh, sure, oh, that works. Seasoned with uh, with uh, spicy pepper. No, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe in our youth we were sp spicy. I don't know if I have the energy to be spicy anymore. But... Uh, so tell us about yourself. Tell us about uh, what got you into music, exactly how long you've been doing it, and sure. you know, highs and lows you feel. Well, I started out, uh, I grew up in Southeast Asia. My dad was in Vietnam for a long time. When we got there, I was five years old. They gave me a serious silver tone guitar to keep me busy. So I worked with that. By the time I was 12, uh, I was playing professionally downtown in Bangkok on Selim Road at the, at the trolley which was a bar for, you know, GIs on R&R. &R. And I came back to the U.S. I got pretty good. Came back to the U.S., uh, went to Boston. So I played the Boston scene for a long time. Got picked up by Don Law. To started touring when I was about 17 with uh, Little Feet, John nice. Mayle, John Hammond, Dr. John, Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, Lowell George, The Birds, uh, The Cars, Mission to Burma, Gang of Four. You know, it just went on. And then I was in Europe for three years with Nick Lowe, Dave Edmonds. And uh, I was in, uh, I was very, very influenced by the scene that was happening in Boston, sort of the new wave, the cars, the neighborhoods. So I had a band called the Atomics. We were very successful. And we toured for years with Mission to Burma, Gang of Four, Reckless Eric, Bram Tchaikovsky, and the Dead Kennedys. And uh, so did that until uh, until uh, time in the road caught up with me. I had to stop. I was going to die. So took some time off, cleaned out. I was smoking and drinking, whatever you put in front of me. And um, cleaned out, uh, refocused on my acoustic stuff, which I started with, and uh, you know, been playing that ever since. And then I have a beautiful, my other half is, her name is Gretchen and she is, uh, she is just wonderful and keeps me, uh, keeps me, uh, uh, she has good guardrails. So <laughs> I try to stay focused. So she and that's what I'm doing. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm writing a lot of songs. I'm playing out all the time. And uh, I have a great band called Eric Summer and the Fabulous Piedmonts. And you can get to us at uh, Eric Summer, S O M M E R dot com. And you can check it all out there. I've got four books of poetry out. I'm a published author. I've read a lot of short stories and I write songs and, you know, try to try to make the world a happier and better place for everybody. That's, That's nice. I say that a lot on my interviews. Uh, people don't realize that when someone's a creative, they're kind of a creative and it doesn't just go in one area. Although I've, I've been writing more lyrics because I'm not a good singer and I'm not a good musician, but uh, you know, and, and I love it when someone does one of my lyrics that really is how I mean it to be. I put mine out there with me singing it and doing and getting some music behind it, but it's, I know it's not good, but I hope that my hopes are somebody will hear the lyrics and think, Ooh, I like those lyrics. I'd like to use them. But like you said, you did some poetry and stuff because people sometimes forget that lyrics are kind of poetry. Well, they are, but but songs are not poetry. I mean, songs are not poems. There's this very specific, um, you know, songs are a very specific category. There's a guy named uh, Max Martin who really changed the whole scene. You know, uh, he he analyzed he and uh, and um, Dennis Pop from Copenhagen analyzed 500 songs and they pulled out the things that make songs specifically different and uh they they got together and they figured it all out and then they were driving around uh, Copenhagen and these kids from Gothenburg Sweden which is just a little bit north had sent them a CD remember CDs everybody so they put the CD in the in the uh, CD player in this car and it was the car was so beat up and it they couldn't get it out. So they it played over and over and over. And so they looked at each other and they said, Man, we gotta fix, we're gonna help these poor kids, we're gonna help these kids. And so they took the song and they remade it. 
and it was a monster hit. It stayed on the charts for 35 weeks. And the kids from Gothenburg who did this in their basement were called Ace of Bass. And the name of the song was I Saw the Sign. Everybody should know that one. It was huge. Right. Couldn't get it off the airwaves. So, you know, and then I do a lot of work in Nashville. And, you know, songs are songs. Poetry is a different animal. But I'm, I'm so glad to hear you're writing both. I mean, a lot of people are, so many people have so much to say and there are very few outlets for them. So, you know, writing poetry is a wonderful, it's just another, it's another side of the coin or the tetrahedron or the quadrahedron. Some people talk about having writer's block and I, I often don't know if, you know, writer's block, sometimes... I think that there's a lot of stuff out there and even like doing videos for YouTube. It's like they say the biggest burnout is people run out of ideas. But, you know, the philosophy I have about a lot of things is what's happening in your life right now? What are you doing right now? Like I wrote a song the one day when my dog was irritating me in the kitchen. And I titled it, I love you, but you got to get the hell out of my way because you're trying to do things in the kitchen and the dog's in your way. But you do love them. Uh, you know, and so I think if you take the attitude, and the same thing with videos, is whatever's on your mind for the day or something you think that's going through your head, if you do a video on it or if you do a song about it, if you approach it in that direction, you know, not everything's going to be a home run. But you're going to have material and you're going to be able to do work with it. I don't know what you think about that, but that's kind of what I think. And I think if you take that approach, it's not as easy to have uh, not have any ideas. I think writer's block is a myth. And if writer's block, you know, you're an idiot because there is so much to say. But you, you have to just calm down and find the path, you know, uh, um, uh Quincy Jones, who tremendous arranger, and uh, you know he, I I believe in his philosophy. Writer's block. It's more like opportunity. It's not a block. It's just you've got to sit down, calm your mind, and the answer will come. When he has that problem, his his approach is he lays down. He tries to get back to his alpha waves, and. He takes a short nap. He wakes up. He's got more ideas than he could possibly handle. And the same with um, Leonard Bernstein did the same thing. Another great composer. When they had, wasn't writer's block. It was more, they were looking for inspiration. And that they did the same thing. They take a short nap. They wake up. Boom. Their mind is going like a thousand miles a minute. They can't stop. So I think writer's block is just a myth. And if you're having it, you know, shut up, sit down, take a few minutes and calm your mind. It'll come. I think of it more as low motivation in some, for some reason, because you, you could write a song about having write, writer's block. Sure. <laughs> you know, you could, have, you could write writer's block blues, you know, what I mean? anything you want. Anything you want. The name the name of the game is that inspiration is everywhere, but it must find you working. Exactly. That's, that is what good... that's what Pablo Picasso said. Inspiration is everything, but it must find you working. The muse can only descend when you're working. That is a good point. So now yeah. we're talking about writing. What uh what are your favorite genres of music? What has been and, and what has been your range over the years? Everything from acoustic country and western to uh uh sound electronic soundscapes and everything in between. Do it all, love it all. And uh, you know, I'm sitting here in a full studio, keyboards over here, guitars over here. Uh, you know, it's just plenty of mics. Here's one here. Here's another one here. I mean, you know, just just keep on going. And I, I right now, my original material, which you can hear at ericsummer.com, you know, some of the stuff like Red Queen is so powerful and gets a lot of airplay. 
and Red Dress, which takes acoustic guitar and slide guitar, and integrates that into a uh, rock pop sort of format. And that's been very successful. But I like the, uh, I like, I like, I like it all. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a genre hog, hog. I, I like it all. It doesn't, doesn't matter to me. Whichever one is, whatever you want, let's go. I used to joke in the old days, not only would I be out with the band, sometimes we'd do five gigs in a weekend, but I'd work for a couple of local uh, music magazines and be writing articles and go and see other bands when I wasn't playing. And I used to joke, people used to, to ask me, what kind of music do you like? And I'd say, I hear too much and I hate it all, I'd tell them. You know, it would be funny. There'd be sometimes I'd come off a weekend from playing and visiting to see other bands. And I wouldn't even turn my car stereo on because I just wanted some time away from it. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but sometimes you do need a little time, you know, to re-groove yourself. Um, I think that's legitimate. Uh, I don't have any problem with that. I, um, I, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I, I, I'm just excited to uh, be able to get up in the morning and write. And I, uh, you know, I am happy, and I'm focused on today. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm focused on today, being in the moment now, and writing whatever, whatever is going on. Uh, whatever my thoughts are, I have a notebook, I have a stack of paper, I keep, you know, maybe a foot high mound of lyrics and song sheets I'm always adding to, I'm always writing stuff down, I have no idea where the good things will come from, but you know, I'll, I'll watch, uh, I'll watch uh, something like um, uh, Perry Mason, and, you know, I, I got a song idea a minute, you know, <laughs> those are some of the best writers for television ever. And it's wonderful. The thoughts are clean, they're crisp, they're clear, you get an idea. And it's very easy then, or less difficult, to put together your um, your um, your uh, song plan. Or, you know, there's a very specific way to write songs. And if you want to get what you want to say across without any problem, you have to write it out. And um, that, you know, the song the song process, the song, the song format, the writing format is an incredibly positive, convenient and excellent way to do it. So that's kind of what I've, what, I, what I've been, um, that's kind of what I, what I've been doing. Um, you know, when it comes to that, I, I just like it all. I'm inspired. I just, uh, um, just excited to be here, excited to write, excited to play, try to, the other thing is, you know, sync music is pretty big where you know music beds for tv shows for advertising for all kinds of things and i have a great account on disco.ac which is an australian platform where all the music supervisors from la and new york go to select uh music and the thing is you got to keep that thing loaded the name of the game is you have to come up with product yeah have it Got to keep coming it up with it. Got to have it all the time. Got to keep rolling, keep composing, keep putting up new stuff because you never know what's going to hit. The more the more times you put your hook in the water, the better your chances of getting something. So I'm pretty focused on that and, uh, and I'm playing. I just got back from a show last night. That took me an hour and a half to get there and it was just spectacular. We have a drummer, Amanda, who is just phenomenal. Uh, she is a symphonic drummer for one of the regional symphonies and uh when we get together, it's just magnificent. We, we love playing there. It's in Winston-Salem. It's called Earl's. And we were there all summer. So we'll be back uh, in 2025. So that's what's happening over here, dude. <laughs> so now you talked about your first uh, guitar being a Silverstone. Yes. Uh, which is funny because I think the last Silverstone I had was a Paul Stanley. Remember how they used to do the, uh, the uh, Kiss guitars and stuff? Uh, well, yeah, I remember Kiss and their guitar, yeah. sure. I remember, yeah, but I remember Silverstone, so that just sticks in my mind. So, and you also said you have a keyboard. What are your uh, favorite instruments to play? You know, I, I I I like cello and guitar, acoustic and electric, and uh, and harmonica. Good harmonica player. That's you know right in there because uh, that's that's where I like. That's my sweet spot. Those. Uh, those um tools are what i use and then i have you know maybe seven or eight guitars all different tunings um 
And that's a big deal. So when you tune something differently, it just, you know, changes the whole texture and the context of what you're doing. So I like that. But, you know, it really doesn't matter. Uh, I'll do whatever you want. And, I'll, and, and, you know, try not to be limited. I, it, you know, sometimes you can make a really cool sound. You just take your, uh, you know, a little microphone out to the woods, just hit a, hit a stick against a tree, record that, take it back in the studio, duplicate it, duplicate it, uh, uh, process it a little bit. All of a sudden you got a whole new uh, um, percussive arrangement that you can go to town with. There's so many things you can do. And again, if you can't think that much, then you should go, you know, McDonald's is always looking for work, workers. So or, you know, Walmart, you could be a greeter. Yeah, you could uh, be a greeter at Walmart. Be a stalker at the Safeway. It's all good. There you go. Now, now, what what role do you prefer in a band? Do you prefer being in charge of the band or just being sometimes uh, a player in the background? I've known people that have their own bands where they're in charge. And every so often they like just being in the band and not being in charge. What do you, what have you found over the years you like the best? Uh, best, the best management is making everybody feel like they're in charge. That's a nice point. And, uh, you know, I never, uh, force anything on anybody. Although, you know, I come with, we play all the material I wrote because nobody else is writing anything. So I always come prepared and, uh, you know, I've got about 40 songs that we do, most of which I wrote. And if I sucked at it, okay, I would do something else. But I don't. I'm a good songwriter and I'm a good player. So put those two together. We have a, we formed a wonderful band. We're doing a lot of my material. We do a couple of covers uh, and, you know, it seems to work. We, you know, but we're not a cover band. We're not a human jukebox. This, we're not, uh, we're not, um, we're not going there. I, I, I hate that. I mean, that just robs creativity and it just gives bar owners, uh, you know, a chance to hire a human jukebox. What the hell does that do? Um, might as well save the money and just get a CD player or a <laughs> Pandora or whatever. But, you know, we're, there are some places that like and love original music and the players that I search for, are really top of the line players. I want to play with people who are as good or much better than I am. Otherwise, I don't learn anything and uh, I don't grow. And uh, when you have players like that, uh, you can just show up with any idea and all of a sudden it will become a song. You know, drums will just pick it right up, bass player will lock right in, done. That's the part of it. Put vocals on top of that, write the vocals right there. I recorded a whole album in a studio, making it up as we went. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And we needed a song, last song. I ah, just made it up and it worked. It was one of the best ones. So that's, that's, that's kind of it. And, but you have to have somebody, you know, making the shows, getting the shows, getting it organized, communicating with everybody, telling everybody where to be, when, and then you got to pay everybody. And a lot of bands are meeting up, uh, couple of kids today or people today, around uh, three, no, on Wednesday. And, uh, you know, this one girl, she's a great singer. She was with a band that the guy um, split everything, uh, but he kept two fifths and gave everybody else one fifth. And, uh, you know, and then he had all the lights and he... You know, I give everybody equal pay. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. It's a trio, cut everything by three. And, and I don't, I'm sure I book all the shows and I make all the contacts, but so what? It, it, I don't need to get paid for that. I do it anyway. And um, I do it for everybody so that we have a, we have something to, uh, to do. We grew this band for a year and a half, almost two years. And this band turns goat piss into gasoline. It is a rocket. And, uh, Partly because it, there's an egalitarian philosophy that permeates the whole arrangement. You know, we show up, get it done. We're all pros. So it's really wonderful. That and sounds I, like that go, go piss into rocket fuel. I got to remember that one. Go piss into gasoline. It's off of the Blues the Brothers. There you go. I like that. Yeah, that's a, 
That's a good one. A couple of things off of what you said, and uh, I'll go backwards. You talked about, you know, the money and stuff. And I said before, I was not a good singer, not a great performer. I usually play bass. I can play a little guitar, maybe some keyboards sometimes, but very basic. But you know what? My specialty for the band was I helped get the gigs. I helped make sure we got paid. I was the one that would go into the office and fight for the money. And sometimes I would forgo my cut to make the other guys a little bit more happy. Sometimes because I was the one that also had a, a day job. Yeah, you know, you got so, to watch out for paycheck players. Paycheck yeah. players, you know, very dangerous. They're only there for the money. So, yeah, I, I, I try well, to avoid we, them. Uh, we played a lot of gigs where you sometimes, you know, they promised you stuff that you didn't get. So. They weren't Welcome really to paid the business. Them. So I wasn't a country band where we hired people as we needed them. It was me and the guitar and the lead guitar player who played rhythm and was a good singer. And depending on the size of the gig, we hired people for the gig, which was nice for one reason, because they listened to what we wanted. We found sometimes when you got a bigger band together, then everybody was sometimes arguing over what they wanted. And it was like, I found sometimes the people that come up with these great ideas, they come up with great ideas, you change things around, you actually like the ideas, but then they leave because they have some other idea to go somewhere else. That's so fine. That you was, keep their, you, you got the other ideas. So fine. Great. That, Don't get attached. Do not get attached to the creative. Don't get attached to it because these things come and go. And the way to handle that is just, oh, okay, great. Hey, thanks a lot. See you later. Good luck. Take that idea, work it on your own. Find somebody else. There are a lot of players out there. Now, we also touched on the the, the uh, playing the cover band music. And that's one of the things I, I had an argument. My son does his own music. He plays in Philly a lot. And uh, there for a long time, he only wanted to do gigs where he only played 100% of his own music. And I'd say to him, well, you know, they kind of like it if you throw some covers in. And I said, throw the covers in and your own music and pick stuff that, compliments your music yeah and he does that now and and it, it you know because they like hearing occasionally a song they know otherwise even if they do like your stuff and i think that's even a lot in the old days a lot of the great artists had covers on their albums the beatles hey, the beatles were a cover band the beatles were a cover band for five years exactly and their first record had uh more songs by other people than by them exactly and people seem to forget that sometimes but uh yep. you know now now he doesn't do that he he throws things in like the last song at the end of the night they did uh one of the beatles songs it was great because he got everybody singing along and stuff but there is a place for the covers but i understand what you're saying about people that only play covers and you're right they're kind of a jukebox although they're there fine. is there is a market for that but yet that's no question I don't know. I like my creative and and now you yeah. write songs. Have you ever written songs for someone else? I have not yet. I nope. just wonder how you de dealt with that because I know artists a lot of times have a hard time and I've had a hard time too. You write some music for and with somebody else and they change it and you're like, ooh, you know, I've gotten two songs I was nominated for Grammys on and I tell you, sometimes it's rough. Like my song about uh, I love you, but you got to get the hell out of my uh, way. That was changed by a gentleman to I love you, but you got to get the hell out of my life. And it's like you kind of didn't get the meaning of the song. But or one time I wrote a song called Iron Cowboy, Iron Horse Cowboy. and It was actually a motorcycle song and it turned into Iron Guitar. And he changed the verbiage of motorcycle into song, song to scooter. It's like, oh. But, you know, when you when you do something with someone else and you turn it over to them, you got to kind of be, it's kind of like, I think, a parent. And you got to be like, now my child is going off to school and there's things they're going to do. You know, you kind of got to look at it like a parent. Like, you're the parent of the song. But you don't have full control over how it lives its life once it leaves you. No, you let know? go. Let it get out there and live. Don't try to control it. You know, let it go. If it comes back to you, it's yours. Don't worry about it. Do not worry about that. That is nonsense. And also, that's a, 
a waste of time, energy, and talent. If you can't write another song, you shouldn't be in this business. Well, yeah, I know. That's that's the biggest thing I had. Uh, my one band had had a record deal, and and the big thing they did was argue with the argue with the the people at the radio at the at the record label, and it was like it ended up going nowhere. And it's like, can't you just go along with it? And I understand you feel like your baby's being mutilated, but it's getting out there, you know. And that sometimes you have to do that as an artist. You have to get your stuff out there until you. I hate to say it until you can come to a point where you can have control that you want control of. And sometimes that might be sad. I don't know if you ever had to deal with that or not really. Uh, say that again. <laughs> sometimes like we, we had gotten a record label of the deal and uh, they wanted us to do different things and change this and change that. And Basically, it turned into a year and a half of the band just arguing with the record label until they finally released us from the from the contract. And it was like they just I felt the band wanted too much control. Until we got started, I mean, let's get some. my philosophy was let's get some stuff out there. And then once we get it out there, let's gather more control is how I felt. You got to read the contract. You got to read the contract. Did you ever see a movie called That Thing You Do? Yes, yes. That's, you know, I love Tom Hanks. That is a very good representation of what the hell goes on. And one-hit wonders are everywhere, a dime a dozen. And, you know, uh, we have a bass player. He's really good. But, you know, when we play, when we were playing in Winston-Salem, he couldn't make it because it was too far to go and he wanted to sell furniture instead that afternoon so okay thank you you know that's just that's just dumb i mean okay you got a steady job that's cool but you know if if that's where your allegiances are then uh, fine go do that don't waste our time and he was a good player but too much trouble that is true sometimes the the uh, baggage that comes with the other person can hurt uh, the whole too. Uh baggage is the name of the game. And that's really what it was. There was a he had a lot of baggage. He was he was wonderful, but he had a lot of uh he's a great bass player, great stand-up player, good electric player, but he wouldn't do anything to uh polish up his talent. Like he had a terrible, terrible singer. And um we got him, I got him voice lessons which helped a lot, but, you know, he, he, he gave it up and, and, you know, wanted to get jazz bass lessons. Well, okay. But we really need him to, if he wants to sing and really want to develop four part harmony and do it well, then, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get some training. I've been taking voice lessons for years uh, in Boston. I took him with Preston Sandiford, right, right above the colonial theater or the Pilgrim theater right on Boston Common. And I did that for probably two, maybe three years, every Tuesday afternoon, hike up the stairs to Preston Sanford. He was a big name uh, in the 30s and 40s. And he had this musty old studio at the top of the of the of this building, right in right in the corner, right in the corner of the combat zone in Boston. But he was wonderful. And the, those exercises never left me. I know how to do them. I know how to warm up with them. And you know, they really work, but our, our bass player wouldn't do it. So, you know, that's okay. He wants to sell lazy boy furniture. Go with God. Good luck. So we've talked about stuff you've done and a uh, question for you. Yes, sir. What is, it, what is it that you'd like to do yet musically that you haven't done yet? What is, what is it that you'd like to do in the future that you haven't done? I would like to get on a 30 or 40 um, uh, show tour with um well we can't do Waylon because he's no longer here with um Elvis Costello if he's still touring or uh maybe a couple of the young young players out of uh Nashville I'd like that but that's where I'm you know I live my my home is that eight by ten area on the stage center stage that's where I like to be that's where I'm best that's where my life starts and that's what I want to do Everything else is preparation. 
uh, that, that, that just made me think, uh, I'll tell you a show that I've kind of enjoyed. Uh, I've seen, uh, Ringo do his all-star show. Love that guy. And, and I love the way he gathers a bunch of artists that are, are known for other things. And then they all take their turns doing their parts of songs that they sure. own for. Uh, when wow. you were saying that tour, I'm thinking, oh, maybe I could see you maybe doing a Ringo All-Star show, you know? Sure, I could do that. But, you know, uh, that reminds me of a wonderful, and I don't mean to harp on Quincy Jones, but he, you know, he came from abject poverty in Chicago, moved to Seattle, and it, it was a, it took him a long time to uh, pick up a horn and found a piano in an abandoned school. I mean, the story is wonderful. And he ended up playing trumpet at a very young age with a lot of the big bands that came through Seattle. So anyway, you can all see that on a, a Netflix special for Quincy Jones. Anyway, when it came time to do We Are the World, he assembled everybody from Michael Jackson to Bruce Springsteen and got them all in one room amazing feat and you know gave them the lyrics showed them how to do it they did it they could only do it in one or two takes because everybody had to go and be other places and it was really a master stroke of organization and people wanting to play with each other and wanting to contribute and that's not the issue i have with uh with jimmy he's a great place but bass player but he 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 doesn't have that um he doesn't have that contributory empathy he, he he you know he's a paycheck player pay him and i'll show up but you know you never know what you're getting because sometimes he'll give a lot sometimes he'll just barely squeak by you don't want players like that you don't well, want like players. i was saying before when we said about paycheck players when we had the two man, uh, when I had the two man country band, and we'd hire drummers and lead guitarists for bigger gigs, sometimes I did like the paycheck player if we got ones that you paid them to do what you wanted them to do, and they did it. Yeah, you know, when when you didn't have somebody that came in and says, "Well, I think we should do this, this, and this," and you're like, "Well, we have it set to do this," and. Uh, I found when they were sometimes when they were paycheck players, if they were good paycheck players, they just did their job and you were happy with them. And that's great. That, if, if you're in the studio or you've got a set show, absolutely. They can come in subs, you know, a good sub who can read, who can write, doesn't give you any shit and shows up, plays the show and is gone. Pay him, done. I like that. That's in and out. But for, you know, I'm still stuck. I'm not stuck. I, prefer to be in an area where the players like last night can't believe what a show it was last night it was amazing um people kept coming and we had a hundred dollar tip from a guy from germany i mean but amanda and i uh she is a symphonic player she is a monster and it she never runs out of percussive ideas and i'm pretty good and together we just you know we just went and uh yeah, we got such a great response. Um, you know, her heart was in the game. She had skin in the game. Her heart was in it. And uh, she she gave over the top. And it was wonderful. And she was hung over as hell. But she <laughs> showed up and she did it. And, you know, that's something that you rarely get with paycheck players. Because they have any skin in the game. They, You know, they're a paycheck that's player. Oh. That's a good point. Uh, now, we talked about what instruments you play. Is there yes, any instrument that you'd like to play on an album or song that you haven't done yet for the effect? I mean, there's a lot of musicians out there that have gone out and done different things, like, uh, I guess it was George Harrison, like that, uh, what do you call it, the sitar or whatever? Sure. He, yeah, I mean, is there anything that you'd like to experiment with on a song that you haven't done yet? Very much so. Thank you for asking. What a great question. Uh, um, I don't know if you can see it. You see that cello in the back? Yes. Yes. I am anxious to become a much better cello player. And to do, uh, you know, to do live 
have the band clear out and let me just do a solo cello <clears throat> and sing. I would love that. Um, and then also, you know, I, when I was very young and growing up overseas, I went to boarding school in Darjeeling, India, uh, which is in the northern part of West Bengal. You can look it up. You can say Joseph's College. You could find it on on um, on YouTube. And it's, it was quite an amazing place. And when I first went there, my dad gave me, you know, some traveling money. We stopped in Calcutta and I bought a sitar. And uh, I took it up to school with me. And the first thing they did was take it away. Never saw it again. Mm. So it was really too bad. And I would, I, I, I would like to, I would like to learn a little bit more about the sitar. sitar. I think that would be fun. And um, especially, you know, if you ever listen to Ravi Shankar, some of the really great sitar players. And George Harrison was no slouch. He was a good, he was a good player. But Ravi Shankar is arguably the top of the top of the heap on that one. And he is a remarkable player. If you've never heard heard him, Ravi R A V I Shankar S H A N K A R. Look him up, rock him out. Uh, you know, he's phenomenal. I like that. I like that. I like cello. But that's it. I don't want to get too cluttered. And, you know, mm. I, uh, I lose my focus. I'm just too spaced out musically. Um, you know, I've got my piano, I've got my cello, I've got all the guitars, harmonica. Um, and, that, you know, that's really, that's really, that's really all I need. And then, you know, they're just tools. Uh, what What's up here is the name of the game. So, you know, I'm trying to write and then when I find the appropriate thing, then I grab a guitar if that's the appropriate thing, or or a Telecaster if that's the appropriate thing, Stratocaster, uh, open tuning, Sears Silvertones. I got plenty of guitars, and 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 that's really it. And I just like to focus and put out put out um, put out good stuff. Paul McCartney is a multi instrumentalist. He does a lot of stuff, and he's a very talented drummer. And he steps in every now and then, shows Ringo how to play. <laughs> and it's good for him but he is he's very unique he's very unique paul mccartney's great i saw him just a couple of years ago and he still still is a great performer hell yeah and i often talk about uh paul mccartney and his ex-wife the deceased uh, about uh how they did wings and how wings was basically him and her yeah and the touring and, band was, and, was and denny cool. Well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, a lot of it was him playing the instruments and recording the different tracks and stuff. Yeah. And, and people don't realize Nine Inch Nails was mostly the one guy also. Yeah. And well, look at the White Stripes. That's just Jack in the studio. Oh, and bring <laughs> yeah. in Meg for a little drumming. Yeah. I mean, and it's thing and people well. talk about the band and you're like, well, no, no insult to the bands, though, but they're kind of touring bands. And the head guy is the guy that does the music and the recordings and, you know, but it's interesting because they're, they're the people with the, the spark of most creativity, you know, and it's amazing when there's people like that, that have that much creativity, I think. And, and there's a lot of things I wish, you know, abilities I wish I had, but sometimes you got to play to your, to your strengths. Like I said, with the band, I used to get us the gigs. I used to take care of the money. I used to, you know, because there was a lot of people in the band that couldn't do that. They might have been a better a better musician or a better singer, but you need everybody to work as a group and pull everything together, I think, you know. So I, I, I never like to let these uh interviews run too long because I know people don't always they don't always keep it hold their attention. So uh I wanted to ask you this question before we were done. What would you like to give as advice to a new young guy or young lady starting out in music? And uh, what would be your advice to them? Content is key. You got to have something to offer. And, and, you know, now it is, um, it is very competitive, but, you know, Taylor Swift sucked a lot of the air out of the room. She's she is great, but you know she doesn't even write her songs, or or arrange them. You know most of that stuff is done by Max Martin, and she has a couple of other players that she or writers that she uses, and she can barely sing. Um, but when she when she does it, it's just her and a cast of thousands. 
Don't be fooled. Uh, she's been doing it a long time. She, I like her because she writes her own music or did. And uh, she's been doing it since she was nine or 10. She was in Nashville when she was 12. And, uh, you know, she's taken her hit and uh, she's worked it through. She got very lucky. And she had some people uh, uh, who believed in her. And she was blonde, fairly cute, and five inches and five feet 11. So she was tall. She was good looking. She had a decent voice and she had good content and she had a lot of breaks. That doesn't happen often. Um, you know, uh, you, you know, if you're just starting out, it's just like high school. You got to make friends. You got to be with the right people. And, you know, you got to treat everybody really well. Because if you don't, it will come back to you when you least expect it and you uh, don't need it. So, you, you know, you want to be, you want to be, uh, you want to be uh, friendly, but you also, you got to have content and you got to be a good player. The three core days of Taylor Swift are long gone. Now, if you want to survive, you've got to be a good player. You have to have something. And by good player, I mean, listen to Cat Stevens. That guy is a very underrated, underappreciated guitar player. Oh, my God. He was phenomenal. Cat Stevens and Chrissy Hind, they they were very unique. They had a – Cat Stevens, very unique voice, wonderful uh, presentation. And, you know, he was gone by the time he was 23. He did, he did it all in a matter of three or four years. And then Chrissy Hind from The Pretenders – she has a very unique voice, a very unique presentation. You got to have something like that. You can't just be on one of the regulars. No, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to survive in that business, you've really got to come up with something different. And I don't mean, uh, you know, get tattoos all over your face or all over your body. That's, that's nonsense, but you got to have something and you got to have a message. You got to have good songs. And you have to be a good player because, and you got to, you better have a thick skin uh, and you got to be able to roll with the punches because there will be many. It is a rough and tumble road out there. And as much as you as a young player might want to get ahead, ha, so does everybody else. So, you know, think of a, think of a new way to, uh, Gretchen just said this the other day, you want to be water and you find an obstacle, be water, go around it. Somehow find another way, find a, another opening. But the name of the game is persistence. You got to keep at it. There's a wonderful movie called The Founder with, um, with Michael Keaton. And it's about the founder of McDonald's and how yeah, that happened. Good movie. He was a, this guy was a salesman, but he, you couldn't keep him down. He sold mixers for milkshakes, but he was at it every day he never quit he was always knocking on doors always and then he saw a great opportunity and you got to watch the movie it's wonderful uh you know he might have done some ethical some unethical things but that's for you to judge but one thing he had was persistence and and he was vicious about it you had to hustle you have to hustle you got to be johnny hustle you got to be johnny on the spot you got to be mr hustle or Miss Hustle, you got to be there and you got to be in, you, you got to be in it and you have to be of it. Think about that. You got to be in it and be of it. Otherwise, you're just playing a game and say, people see right through that in a heartbeat. And then try to be authentic. The best thing you have is your authenticity. Don't bullshit anybody with bad content, borrowed lyrics. Um, I was playing with a guy the other night. And he was, it was, it was wonderful, but you know, he was almost copying verbatim Kenny Chesney. And I'm like, dude, I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking, dude, wow, what are you doing? You know, it's a nice song, but you're fucking it up because you know, those are not your lyrics. Those are Kenny Chesney's ideas. What's wrong with you? And well, you have, sorry, go ahead. Now all you have to do is change a couple of words or, or, the the key about that is, and I love this guy. He was wonderful. And I'm I'm not gonna say his name because I, I love the guy. He was great. But that was inauthentic. And 
the one thing you have when you get out there in the world and you're really trying to beat your path to uh, some, sign of, some kind of musical success, you got to be authentic, which means be original, be yourself. Don't do anything. Don't learn from other people, but don't be them. Uh, you know, you, you can't do that. You can't live somebody else's life. You got to live your life. Remember what Steve Jobs said. There's a great, Steve Jobs gave a commencement address at Stanford, I think 85 or 95. Go look it up. But that, that speech will guide your life. That speech will show you the road. And, and he'll tell you how he did it. He'll tell you specifically what to do and how to do it. It was, it's just inspirational. You can't imagine what that, what that uh, speech does. It's, just, it's wonderful to watch him and to listen to him. And he had cancer and he knew he was dying. So, you know, what does he do? He goes out and tries to communicate. That's great. And that's the other thing. You got you to gotta have, gotta have something to say. You know, Taylor Swift, the... She is a once in a in a in a uh, generation phenomenon, but she hit her audience, the 13, 14, 15 year old girls. She hit them, she captured them, and they have been steady with her through her entire career. She's now 36. Those girls have been following her all along. You can't fill the stadium she's filling and, and you know, without without a fan base that will that will kill for you and those girls will all those girls 12 13 14 and 10 as young as that you know followed her through her career she kept them as fans that's how she did it she kept them as she grew older her fans grew older and she modified her music to reach them it's really it's really remarkable if you want to make a hit look at Where's your audience? Say it's 20 year olds. That's what you want. So what was happening? What were they listening to 10 years ago? What were they listening to 15 years ago? Go find that music and study it and learn from it and take some things from it. Not lyrically, but musically, progressions, beats, um, mixes, how, they, how, how, how that music, how that sound was. And use that, incorporate that into your new stuff. You'll capture that audience because there'll be 20 right now and they will relate to it. That's one thing nobody ever tells you, but that's one thing Max Martin and Dennis Pop did very, very well. And then go listen to I Saw the Sign by Ace of Bass. You can see what a pop monster is and how it was made. It's wonderful. Yeah, the, I mean, a lot of interesting points uh, I always like to tell people, well, yeah, yeah, the, we had a couple points there I wanted to mention. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hustling. I find a lot of people don't want to hustle. And I've known, and it's not just music, but everything in life. I've seen the same thing with athletes, musicians. You can have people that are phenomenal. Oh, yeah. But if you don't hustle, it doesn't matter. It's my joke, uh, Yeah, my joke about some mu musicians is, they're terrific, but they think that they're going to be sitting on the toilet playing the guitar and someone's going to hear them driving by and stop and knock on their door and say, hey, I want to give you a music contract because I just heard you sitting in your bathroom playing on the toilet, your guitar. Yeah, and that's I, like you're smoking that's crack. <laughs> that I mean, will never happen. But there's people like that where they sure. think, you know, uh, and it doesn't happen. And, uh, and then they get very like, angry. Then they get very angry and disillusioned and they don't understand why they're not making it and they piss everybody off and who wants to work with them? It's like exactly. a career killer. Don't do it. You know, don't do it. Do the best. And the other, here's the other thing. Don't get attached to the outcome. That is the kiss of death in this business. Do not get attached to the outcome. Go up, show up, sing your song, make your statement. Let go. That is and a good point. Go. Yeah. Walk away. Go do something else. Go write a new song. You know, if you, but but don't get attached to the outcome because you will always be disappointed. It'll never be what you wanted. It'll always be something different. Might be good, might be bad, but who cares? 
The fact is you showed up, you did it, you made a difference, you made, you put something out there, let go of it. Done, over, move on that to something good, else. That's what you need to do with your lyrics when someone else changes them too. Is I, I actually have a poster up that says, let that shit go. And that's to remind yeah. me sometimes about things to let it go. Yeah, the other thing who, he talked about was that, so, writing your own songs and, and being behind it. I, uh, talking about, I used to deal with comics and comics, one comic said to me one time, he said, when I interviewed him, he said, I find the best jokes are the ones I write about my life. He said, because then when I tell them, I have my feelings and my life experience behind it. And I think that works with the music also, or like a situation where I know uh, Alan Cole, uh, Co. Uh, I worked security for him one time, and he talked about songs that him and Kid Rock wrote together, and how that it worked out nice because they had similar uh, similar circumstances. They had been taking care of one of their so each taking care of one of their sons by themselves, and together they had written some songs together. Uh, or uh, together and separate, you know, but the process worked out so nice because they had a similar circumstance and experience and how that made the song better for both of them. And I, I think that's a point too. When you're performing something that you're emotionally vested in because it's about you and your life, I think they can put more of themselves into it. And I think that's important, uh, not just to be regurgitating something, but putting you into it, you know, I think that's, that's important. I think that's what gets you the people that like you is when the people get to like you because you're putting yourself out there. I don't know what you think about that, but I think that's important. One of the things I just wrote an interview or a review of a show by this little girl named Madeline Me. She is really big. She is a 20 year old uh, kitty pop from Albuquerque, New Mexico. So she's got some big shoes to fill. Uh, uh, Linda Ronstadt is the queen. And, you know, she, this this girl is really good. But, um, you know, she had, she, had, she had her audience. She had reached out to these kids who showed up for her show. It was only half full. But these kids were rabid, were rabid supporters. They had elf ears. They had capes. Their moms were with them. Who cares? It was $28 a ticket. And she half filled the room. So that kind of small tour was really good. But, you know, she was a she was a TikTok star. She did her music, put it out there on TikTok. I I I feel different about TikTok. I if I wouldn't uh, if you like what I'm doing, you want to see me, come and see me. I'm not going to put stuff out. I just don't. Uh, I'm in the uh, practice, uh, the, uh, the, I want to travel the road that ZZ Top did, you know, they never did live, live, uh, TV or any of that because they wanted you to come and see them. And it worked. It worked really well. And then MTV came on and they were the first band up there and that blew my, that, that made it. They were the first big band on, on you, on MTV. They couldn't believe they're watching it one night they go, what the hell is this and uh they said wow we should get on that they did and you know they put up what do they their first song was uh was um uh what did they put on there uh, i forget but you can look it up that zz top um netflix thing is wonderful it's wonderful hey i've enjoyed speaking with you guys this has been wonderful yeah i'll let i'll let you go uh anything you'd want to say in closing um, yes, thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you can, I would enjoy a uh, head over there and see what you think. Any thoughts or comments at ericsummer.com. You can find it all there, the Piedmonts, the books, the writings, the reviews, and and all the interviews. It's all that, you know, such as this one with, with John, which I'll post. But, uh, you know, go and see what I'm doing. Listen to it and uh, give me your thoughts. Just trying to make friends and play music. Rock on. Peace out. Well, thank you very much for being with us. And I will put the link down below to your website also. And I hope people uh, find your schedule and come out and actually see you. I and think, it, I think it would you. be wonderful. 
And and I'd like to get up to Harrisburg. I've been through there before. I played through there all the time. Uh, I haven't been up there in a few years, but Philly, that whole area, I love it. One of the big bookers here is John Harris. So if you wanted to look him up, I'm sure he would get something. It's just H-A-R-R-I-S. And uh, I'm where, sure is he, he in, where is he? He's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Just oh. John Harris. Just uh, do that. And he, he's been a booker for years. I remember uh, him booking gigs in the eight, early 80s. You know, so I'll he's out there. Out. Contact him and hopefully I'll. I'll either see a live show of you here or I'll travel and come see you up there. But thanks for being with us today. My pleasure, John. I wish you much, much success. Loved your radio show. You're a great in interview. Rock on. Peace out, baby. Thank you.